was the uh, CEO of the company Biotrend, uh, and he has a long, let's say, long-standing experience in transforming different types of waste streams into polyesters, biopolyesters. Uh, so, Bruno, you have the floor. Thank you, Thomas. Very nice way to say that I'm getting old, I guess. So uh, that comes, that uh, goes with the long uh, standing experience. I hope you see well my slides. Yes, I can see it. It's good. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So um, as Thomas mentioned, uh, our, this presentation will address the production of biopolyesters from wastes. Um, I will not focus exclusively on the case that has been um, studied within a volatile but rather provides an overview of the opportunities challenges and some advances in the that we uh, at biotrend contributed to um, in order to try to to realize this goal this goal which is to um, produce valuable products uh, from uh, wastes just a very short word about biotrend in a nutshell, what we do is what is depicted at the bottom of the slide. So we are a bioprocess development company specialized in developing, optimizing, and scaling up uh, bioprocesses, um, mainly fermentation-based processes and um, transferring um, concepts that work well in the lab and uh, to, the, to the commercial scale. And yeah, so um, we focus very much on maximizing productivity, yields, and titers um, to try to reduce the uh, production costs and make sure that the uh, strategies that we, we implement are robust enough to um, allow the, the transfer to, to, to real commercial scale. So by trend, we operate a state-of-the-art development uh, lab and pilot plant. And once we need uh, to transfer these processes to either the demonstration or commercial scale, we partner with uh, different uh, demonstration facilities and commercial facilities with the appropriate capacities um, uh, throughout Europe. Um, something actually quite unique about Bytrans experience and capability uh, is the use of many different types of raw materials. So the typical uh, fermentation company will mostly focus its activity on the use of commercial sugars or oils, uh, which we all know uh, that, that this use has, has come into intense debate lately uh, due to the uh, awareness that these raw materials compete uh, with the, their uses as food or feed. And so we have been working um, very intensively, not only uh, within uh, the framework of European collaboration, uh, research, collaboration research projects, but also in direct contacts with, um, with clients. We've been working intensively, as I was saying, with um, uh, side streams of existing businesses, which are listed on the left. And on the bottom, you can see last, but by all means, not the least, VFAs from anaerobic digestion. So typically we um, use these raw materials, um, process them, uh, eventually pre-treat them in order to render them fermentable. And the, um, the, the product of interest can be extremely diverse from just microbial biomass cell extracts or for the purified um, materials such as bioplastics, chemicals, and uh, enzymes. Um, in this particular presentation, I will address uh, the case of the production of bioplastics. Um, we and I will present uh, some of the work that has been generated in different projects, um, including bug workers, fungus chain, PHP to market, which have uh, used uh, lignocellulosic uh, materials, Bridget as well, and Volatile, the, the, the project that brings us all here, um, uh, uh, in which we used the um, uh, permeates from anaerobic digestion, which are rich in volatile fatty acids, as you all know. Um, we are also active, and sorry, going back, and the uh, 
specific focus at Bytrend is the use of pure culture fermentation. That means that we only have one microorganism in the reactor converting the uh, raw material to the product. There are uh, other processes uh, like anaerobic digestion itself in which mixed cultures are involved. Uh, we don't uh, carry out mixed cultures at Biotrend, but there exist systems which um, uh, allow to produce also biopolyesters uh, uh, bio using mixed culture uh, systems. And uh, when we work uh, with the systems, we only work in the extraction and purification of the uh, uh, biopolyesters from the uh, microbial biomass which is generated. But I will come back to, to this a little bit more um, in more details. So um, in this project, we are particularly interested in these molecules, which are uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates. So these are polymers uh, which can have a molecular weight in excess of uh, 1 million Daltons. And um, they are quite diverse in their structure. Um, because they can have, uh, they can be composed of very different monomers. Um, and uh, these monomers have uh, different side chains as well. And all this variability and all this diversity, I should say, uh, have an impact on the diversity of the, of the mechanical and thermal properties that the polymers have, uh, meaning that the potential applications are quite diverse as well. And it's not only the um, uh, monomeric composition uh, as such. For example, in the top line here, you can see a PHB, which is a homopolymer of hydroxybutyrate. Uh, but when you talk about PHBV, which is a copolymer of hydroxybutyrate and hydroxyvalerate, not only the amount of monomers is relevant, but also the distribution throughout the chain can have significant impact on the properties. So this gives you an idea on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the, the, the wide range of materials that can, be, that can be produced and also, uh, of course, on the challenge to reproducibly uh, come out with a product with uh, constant specifications that meet our needs. So very simply, how do the um, organisms, how do our microbes accumulate polyhydroxyalkanoates? Just like us humble humans, when we eat too much, like myself, I should say, and we get a little bit fat, we accumulate excess carbon in uh, the form of lipids. So these particular bugs are uh, maybe a bit more clever and they don't accumulate carbon in the form of lipids, rather, uh, in the form of very useful compounds uh, like uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates, which are carbon-rich molecules, we don't con which don't only contain carbon, um, hydrogen, and oxygen. And so if you um, have a perfectly balanced medium with all the components which are required for the, the, the bugs to, 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 to reproduce and to, to, to increase the biomass uh, uh, amount, then the bugs will grow, they will multiply without any uh, restriction. But when you, you uh, either uh, uh, cause an imbalance between carbon and other essential elements like nitrogen or phosphorus, if you have an excess of carbon, then the organisms, the organisms uh, start to accumulate the excess of carbon in the form of uh, polyhydroxyalkanoates. So, to, and, and, and why is this important? And, and, and why are we trying to produce um, polyhydroxyalkanoates from volatile fatty acids? What's the motivation behind it? So today the commercial production is um, exclusively or mainly perform using pure culture and using refined raw materials like sugars and oils. Um, and there are very limited grades out there, particularly for the sh shorter chain polyhydroxyalkanoates, which comprise PHB and PHBV. Um, the incorporation of valerate in this, uh, this copolymer uh, is very low, up to 3% only. So uh, ultimately, the mechanical properties of the PHBV, which is commercially available, are not that different from the uh, homopolymer. 
which is a problem because these materials tend to be, to be extremely brittle. So if we would be able to diversify a little bit the monomeric composition, uh, then the material properties would be a little bit different as well, and eventually um, open up the processing windows in the various applications that these materials can be. Very importantly as well, um, the production costs are still uh, significantly high and significantly higher than the um, conventional petrochemically based uh, polymers. So if uh, a drop-in application is envisaged, the, uh, the market penetration is quite limited. And the main pressure points in this uh, production costs are the cost of raw materials and also the cost of the purification of the, uh, uh, of the product, meaning the extraction of the polyhydroxyalkanoates and purification. And also very important, today uh, just a handful of manufacturers exist. So although a lot of announcements of, of future capacity and a future availability of material has been, have been made in the last 10 to 15 years, uh, the, the reality is that uh, uh, very few companies exist on the market which supply these uh, polymers to date. So the research drivers are quite obvious after this uh, first one, the use of industrial site streams uh, or waste as raw materials. Um, the obvious advantage, uh, advantages of that are, uh, for once, you, uh, we're not competing with food, uh, with users uh, in the food uh, or feed industry um, um, and uh, of the raw materials. And, um, Typically, these side streams have a much lower uh, cost than the refined raw materials. However, that comes to a price, which is uh, the variability and the complexity of these streams with varying composition. And this, of course, needs to be taken into uh, consideration when the process is being designed. And uh, the other pressure point, as I mentioned, is the purification process. So, um, preferably aqueous based. It's very easy to purify these um, compounds using solvents, but that's something that is really being phased out from the industry. And um, also if you want to use uh, industrial or municipal site streams or waste, um, you don't want to transport the waste uh, throughout uh, tens or hundreds of kilometers to a centralized, a large centralized operations. If possible, you want to process that stream on site or close to the site and to perform the purification to obtain your product as well in a decentralized way. So this is also a, a challenge that we, we try to address to come up with an aqueous-based process which could be implemented in a decentralized way and uh, if possible, using standard and readily available equipment, for example, at wastewater treatment plants, and that the staff at these plants are used to, and not going to uh, more complex um, systems uh, using solvents, which are, have their specific uh, safety requirements and also specialized training of the staff. So um, in this picture, um, uh, you can see the, um, how the polyhydroxyalkanoates are um, uh, accumulated in the biomass. And this is a picture of one culture, which clearly uh, shows you that even if a, a culture in average has a biomass with an intracellular content of let's say 40% of PHA, in the culture you will have a mix of cells. Cells with a very high content of PHAs and some cells which are completely devoid of PHA depending on the life cycle of the cells and the, how long they've been accumulating the uh, the, the the excess carbon and so it's not uh, it's it's a challenge in a way because uh, when you try to extract the pha you need to first digest the outer shell of the molecule of the um, cellular content in order to release the biomass and it's not the same thing and the, the same conditions which are optimal to extract uh, the pha from a cell which has 80 percent of polymer is uh, of course not the same uh, as the requirements and conditions to extract the, the polydroxalchemates from a cell which only has 30% of polymer. Uh, since you're using a mix, uh, the processes need to be tuned in order to 
release and uh, purify the PHA uh, to a certain extent in order to reduce the levels of impurity, but also uh, not to try to digest the PHA itself. And this is the, the depicted here. So um, the lower the amount of PHA within the cells, the more aggressive you need to be, and the lower the yield will be in the end. And um, uh, if the, the yield is lower, it means that um, you're probably attacking, we're probably attacking the, the polymer itself with the chemicals that we use to perform the digestion. And if we attack the polymer, um, the, the properties uh, will be changed because the um, polymeric chain might be breaking up or some of the side uh, chains of the polymer may be reacting uh, in such a way that the, the, the properties are, 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 are changed. So going to some specific cases, um, this was actually our first project in this field and it was already more than 10 years ago. Um, and we used wheat straw hydrolysate, uh, which uh, ended up being a, a really nice material to work with. Um, we, we were able to um, obtain productivities which were uh, very similar to the productivities, uh, the productivities that we would get from commercial sugars. And this was a very clean fermentation, if you will, and we were able to um, easily extract and purify the polymer how and uh, without having um, much effect on the uh, properties of the of the polymer so when uh, on the bottom table you have specifications of the commercial php and this was the uh, php or homopolymer and you uh, also have the properties of the polymer that we produced in the lab as extracted by chloroform extraction. And chloroform extraction um, is a method which is very good for analytics because it does not uh, break down the polymer. It uh, maintains the native properties of the polymer. And then we performed an acid digestion. Um, it was okay. The properties were um, maintained to, to a very good extent, um, but we were not very happy of using concentrated acids as uh, a digestion um, uh, uh, process due to several several constraints, including compatib compatibility of equipment with, with the, the, the acidic conditions, which would uh, require a very expensive equipment to, to implement this process. Um, in a subsequent um, project, we work with a much dirtier material, uh, spent sulfite liquor from, from the pulp and paper industry, and um, in this process, we used a different, um, uh, in this project, um, we, uh, before the purification, you can see that the biomass concentration and the PHP concentration was much lower than in the previous one, which uh, reflects some toxicity from some of the components of the raw material on the fermentation itself, uh, which is something that we always need to assess as well. And also the uh, the slurry that we got from the fermentation was quite dark and some uh, which indicated that a lot of contaminants from the uh, original raw material were brought down to the fermentation. And in the end, we needed to try to remove these impurities from the um, from from the commercial uh, from the purified material. And uh, you can see on the right hand side, the slides uh, showing um, different materials, which were, um, uh, the, the material was processed in the exact same way, but dried differently. On the top, uh, the yellow powder was dried in an oven. The white powder was dried in a spray dryer, which um, uh, immediately shows us that the residence time is very important in order to, um, um, in order to reveal uh, or to 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 to, in, to to the browning of the the end material, but we don't expect our polymer to become brown. So all that browning is indeed caused by impurities. And then when we melt the polymer, we try to melt the polymer. The material that was often dried doesn't melt melt at all. And the one which was spray dried melts a little bit, but there's some still some granularity and color which indicates that the purity was not. Uh, perfect. 
And um, although the purity was not up to our standards, um, you can see on the bottom table that the, um, the molecular weight of the polymer decreased significantly from uh, almost 1.3 uh, 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 million Daltons to uh, 600 kilodaltons. So we halved the uh, average molecular weight. So although we had an aggressive um, purification process, the purity was not too poor. And this brings us to, to, to a point in, in some processes, we need to decide what, what do we want to use these uh, polymers for. Um, obviously for this particular application to have a very thorough purification would probably not be sustainable both from an economical and environmental point of view so we try to figure out whether uh, we could uh, take the the these impurities take the fact that we have these impurities to our benefit and together with uh, with a partner in the project um, uh, the, 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 we found out that this kind of uh, composite material uh, comprising PHA, lignosulfonates, and still some cellular material uh, would be an extremely uh, powerful um, uh, uh, flame retardant additive to, 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 to plastics. And finally, coming to, to volatile. Um, here we use concentrated VFAs in our uh, fermentations. Um, and uh, in, in the streams that we get and in the material that we get, as you can see, we have uh, quite a diversity of different volatile fatty acids, uh, which is very interesting, uh, as you will see in the next slide. Because depending on the type of uh, volatile fatty acid that you have as raw material, um, the bacteria that we use will process these volatile fatty acids differently and uh, the different volatile fatty acids will originate different building blocks in the polymer. And at least theoretically, we could even produce terpolymers, meaning polymers with three different monomers. So here we come to this uh, uh, goal of having a more diverse uh, uh, structure and properties of the polymer in order to try to render it useful for a wider uh, range of possible applications. Um, so um, we started uh, during volatile to uh, simulate these mixed volatile fatty acids um, and we were successful in producing PHA uh, uh, and accumulated PHA intracellularly and actually detecting three different monomers in the, in the, in the polymer by GCMS and confirmed by uh, NMR later on. Uh, one of the challenges that we have uh, when we develop these uh, fermentation processes, and this is common to uh, all fermentation processes that you will hear um, uh, in the next presentations as well, is that the VFAs can be uh, toxic uh, to the cell. So the, 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 the feeding rate, the, 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 the way you feed and the, the, the um, the accumulation of the VFAs in the fermentation needs to be very much uh, monitored and taken into account in order to um, not to have any toxicity effects in the culture. Um, uh, after we did this work with uh, a mix of commercial VFAs, uh, we received a real uh, VFA permeate from the volatile partners. And uh, although the productivities would, were a bit lower, and this is only due to the fact that the initial um, uh, samples that we got were not as concentrated as the mix of commercial VFAs that we used, uh, but at least the proof of concept was, was there and we were able to uh, produce PHA in significant amounts. And the more concentrated the VFA stream will be, as Philip alluded to, uh, the more productive and the higher will be the titers of the PHA in the fermentation uh, process. And importantly, uh, uh, it's important to, to, to mention as well that the compositions of the uh, the polyhydroxalkane weight that we uh, produced in a range of uh, around 20% hydroxyvalerate already allowed the material to be a quite elastic and not as brittle as the um, uh, PHB homopolymer. So now, now moving a little bit to the uh, mixed culture systems, these are very diluted systems. 
Um, they have uh, quite um, uh, limited dry weight between 6 and 12 percent and taking into account the uh, amount of PHA, the typical amount of PHA in these cultures, in the end we need to clean and digest between 94 percent to 98 percent of the material uh, which is quite challenging. So you if you have a, a truckload of uh, this mixed culture material uh, you need a lot of effort and processing in order to only get a limited amount of polymers. So from a truck like this with around uh, 30 cubic meters of, of culture, you would only get uh, 200 kilos of uh, pH, uh, PHBV in the end. Uh, further, um, in these mixed culture systems, there's a huge variability of the biomass. As you can see, a basic... Um, uh, properties like the sedimentation of the biomass uh, changes a lot from batch to batch, which, as you can uh, uh, imagine, uh, it's a nightmare. And this is a real material that we received from um, a site uh, in a wastewater treatment plant in, in Italy. Um, uh, this is an example from um, a system which, a mixed culture system, which was coupled to the treatment of. Um, cheese way a cheese uh, from cheese way and even in a more defined uh stream waste stream still the um the the mixed nature of the culture meaning that the population inside the reactor is changing over time also results in significant changes in the um in the accumulation intercellular accumulation of of pha and overall in the performance of the system so this is a bit of a challenge when you want uh, to have a reproducible process to extract the polymer from uh, within the cells. And uh, the standard process that we used for a pure culture um, uh, 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 production of PHA didn't work directly uh, with the mixed cultures and we needed to increase uh, either the constant, the amount of chemicals, the concentration of chemicals, or, or the residence times in the reactors, in order to get um, uh, a decent purity in the end. And um, the, the the state of the art protocol, uh, not using solvents, involves um, an alkaline treatment followed by the a bleach protocol. Uh, the problem is that when we started to generate a larger amounts of PHA, uh, which has been uh, purified using this process, um, we, the, 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 the final users were complaining of this uh, uh, swimming pool smell of the polymer. And when the, the, the polymer was, was um, used um, to um, produce pellets that were to be extruded later on, so heated up and molten, um, they definitely detected a very strong chlorine, chlorine smell, and this is um, uh, and this is a strong indication that we may have uh, a generation of um, organochlorinated molecules, which are hazardous, extremely hazardous, and also um, the generation of uh, with the, the the residual moisture of. Um, hydrochloric acid vapors that would um, uh, corrode, completely corrode the equipment of the processors. So we wanted to uh, move away from this and we developed at Biotrend a protocol which generates in situ reactive species that degrade cellular biomass. And uh, we uh, were able to significantly reduce the amount of chemicals and got rid of this swimming pool smell and we can do a room temperature uh, di uh, digestion of the of the biomass and implement the process quite easily in stirred uh, vessels and using solid liquid applications so the process worked very well although we it needed to be fine-tuned depending on the um on the uh, uh pha containing uh material that we were receiving so there's always an optimization which needs to be uh, performed depending on the biomass that we get and the, the the dirtier the sample the more aggressive the conditions that we need to to use of course uh, but uh, after some uh, optimization we can actually uh, purify uh, uh, polyhydroxylcanoids from uh, real life scenarios and this is an example from uh, 
uh, a mixed culture uh, treat uh, using um, different fractions of uh, a waste treatment plant uh, in Treviso in Italy. And um, we were actually able to come up with a, a very nice uh, purity of the final polymer and uh, preserving actually the molecular weight of the, of the polymer. And uh, you will see that the molecular weight is much lower than the ones that I showed before, but this is um, uh, due to the fact that you're using mixed cultures and with mixed cultures, normally the molecular weight is much lower than uh, in the case of pure cultures. And, and, and this depicts uh, quite well uh, the optimization that we did. So by decreasing the amount of chemicals and changing the composition of the chemicals, the decrease in molecular weight was very much reduced and we preserved the native uh, uh, properties of the polymer, which was then validated. The usefulness of this polymer was then validated in different processability studies uh, through electrospinning, for example, and extrusion. And um, yeah, and this is another example from the cheese whey process. Um, uh, the reduction of chemicals was quite substantial from the benchmark conditions to the optimized conditions. This is very important from the cost point of view and also our sustainability point of view. Um, the molecular composition of the polymer was preserved. It means that the side streams were not affected the side stream or the side chain, sorry, of the monomers were not affected by the digestion uh, process, and we preserved quite nicely the native properties of the polymer. And also in terms of molecular weight, you can see the 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 the, the, the size exclusion chromatograms are are very comparable uh, from the native polymer and the uh, polymer uh, purified at biotrend. And in the end, what actually validates all this process. Um, is the possibility to use the polymer um, in the final applications. And uh, we were able with a partner to produce uh, various kilograms of pellets that were later on used to perform um, trays for the food for the food industry. So a scale up uh, successful. Uh, we're now performing the transition towards continuous uh, operation and towards more than 100 kilograms produced at Biotrend using different types of, uh, of uh, side streams um, and different types of uh, processes, both the pure cultures, as I mentioned, the mixed cultures, and the application was validated uh, by different methods. And, and I would like to point out the, the, your attention to the picture uh, in the middle. Um, in this picture, you can see two parts on the left-hand side, which are a bit yellowish and the remaining parts are uh, white. Uh, so these yellowish parts were produced using the commercial PHB on the market, whereas the, the, the white parts were produced using the polymer purified at Biotrend. And for the plastics industry, this, this makes a, a huge difference because in the white part, you can, uh, you can put any pigment you want and you, you can color the part the way you want if you have a, a brownish or yellowish background, that's that's not the case. And so, yeah, so uh, just to finalize, I'd like to acknowledge all the partners which um, produced all the nice or nasty raw materials, depending on the case, uh, which we used to produce the PHA and the downstream partners, as we call them, that um, uh, actually uh, uh, provide uh, a very strong guidance on where uh, we are progressing in the in the right way in terms of providing materials that can be uh, useful uh, in a, in a, in a, in a real life. And of course, uh, thank you to the volatile partners. It has been a very uh, uh, a very long journey, but a, a very fun and and productive journey, which I hope we'll be able to continue in the short term. Um, and uh, for the audience at large, uh, be free to contact me uh, whenever you want, either to clarify some doubts or to discuss uh, opportunities of waste valorization, or just pay, a, pay us a visit at, uh, at Biotrend. Thank you very much. Bruno, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, presentation about the uh, different uh, possibilities in the third generation biorefineries to transform different types of waste in polyhydroxyalkanoates, also biopolyesters. 
Um, I have also some questions for you. Um, the first question is from Rakesh Nair. Was the PHA produced during the project actually used for an application? How did the final product look colored or transparent? Uh, do you want to answer or should I answer? How we... Thomas, you can answer because you're the applications guy in this case. Uh, exactly. Okay. No, yes. Uh, also, yes and no. And we, we produced biofilms out of it. So we uh, obtained the, the PHA extracted by, by Biotrend and we made um, biofilms uh, with hot pressing, uh, yeah, with a hot press to characterize later on the biomaterials uh, a little bit uh, from, from material characteristics. Uh, so that's not 100% um, let's say comparable with an extrusion process or whatever, but to get some, some characteristics for, for the, the biofilm, this is uh, uh, already a good indication. And the colors that, as uh, Bruno showed also some pictures there, um, if it's properly extracted, um, then it will be white or more or less white. Uh, nevertheless, also in our hot pressing, as Bruno showed also some photos, depending on the on the application temperature, uh, some of the samples which we produce with the hot press, which is quite, let's say, ex ag uh, aggressive. In this context, we're a little bit brown, but it's not a uh, real um, yeah, extrusion process or whatever, uh, as Bruno was also showing the other photos from the other materials from other uh, uh, products. So uh, mainly it would be white, but there are also some some light brown uh, or, or colored uh, things depending on the the temperature during the processing. Um, then Rakesh is also asking in the first extrusion how much of PHP and how much other materials are added. I don't know if you refer to another of the slides from from Bruno as well, during volatile we used only hot pressing Bruno do you want to answer to this yeah so it, it actually depends on the final application and the project uh, that we were um, working on and uh, but I do remember one project in in all these um, like in any polymer you don't use the pure polymer uh, when you process it you need to use a formulation and uh, even the, um, the yeah, the, you, you need to use plasticizers, some, some, uh, sometimes antioxidants or stabilizers. Uh, but uh, in, I remember that in one of the projects which we had a quite challenging application, which was the production of filaments for 3D printing applications. Um, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the final formulation at 90, 95%, around 95% of PHA, and the other additives were only 5% of that. And among these additives, um, if I recall well, 3 to 4% were all bio-based additives as well. So it was a really, really compelling result with, with that respect. Thanks. And then you have uh, one more question, uh, uh, Bruno, um, from, oops, now it was going, uh, uh, Slavomir Sizielski. You showed the comparison of PHA synthesis using pure VFEs and permeate. Was the composition of pure VFEs mixture the same as in the permeate? Uh, it was quite comparable, yes, because um, before we decided on which, which mixtures to, to, to uh, use in our mock trials, uh, we did consult with OWS, which provided us the range of specifications that was expected um, in, the, in, the, in the real operation. And so all the prior trials were, were performed, taking that information into account, which proved to be quite accurate in the end. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, well, ah, thanks. Slavomir Sizetsky says thanks. Um, okay. If there are no other questions in the moment, uh, as well, anyway, you have seen, you have the email address also there from Bruno was in the, in the presentation. And um, you can also ask later on, uh, as Bruno will be also later on in the round table. So if you have further questions, he will be for sure very happy to answer them this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Bruno. Then uh, I will now shift to the next uh, presentation.
Der will die dann bei, bei Markus Neureiter von Boku 